Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to another Target 2035 webinar. And today we've got a great panel to discuss uh, open science antibodies. And I'd like to introduce our moderator for today, Stephen Fuchs from the Institute for Protein Innovation in Boston. Um, he's got a long background in uh, protein structure function, has worked in epigenetics and protein recognition and, um, and now uh, very heavily involved in antibody uh, research. And uh, Stephen, welcome. And we're looking forward to your program. You're muted. There okay, you sorry about that. Good start. Um, thank you, Cheryl, for the introduction. Um, thank you to Target 2035 for um, hosting this event uh, and giving us the opportunity to talk with people. Um, and now I'm also having trouble sharing my screen for some reason. We just went through this and it was fine. Um, let's see, share screen. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to switch to this and hopefully everyone can see. Um, Everyone can see my screen? Okay, cool. Um, so let me give you a, a sort of brief uh, overview of, of the plan of events for today. Um, I'm gonna give this brief introduction. And then, um, you know, the, the purpose of today is to talk about the whole process of making antibody, uh, antibody tools available, you know, through, through open science. Um, so I'm gonna start with uh, talking about antibody discovery, focusing on antibody discovery. Um, Simona Colantonio is going to give a uh, presentation about uh, antibody development and characterization. And then at the end, Megan Rigo from, from Agene is going to talk about distribution of antibodies. And, and sort of we're going to go sort of from the, from the start to the finish. How do we make antibodies and how do we get them to people? Um, each of the presentations should be about 15 minutes or so. Um, there'll be time for a little bit of Q&A between each talk and then uh, the hope is at the end that we'll have some time left over to have a, a panel discussion to sort of dive a little bit deeper into into uh, this topic and, and and specifically how it relates to to the target 2035 and and, and sort of making re biological reagents available to to all you know all protein targets. Um, just some some housekeeping for today. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, so um, you can share it with your friends uh, later and. Everybody can take a look. Um, and the chat function, I believe, has been disabled. So if you have a question, and we encourage lots of questions, um, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can post it there. Um, I'll do my best to monitor that. And, and we'll try to hit the, Q, the, the questions in the Q&A session and again in the, in the panel discussion at the end. Um, and at the bottom, there's a, there's a note about uh, giving feedback uh, on, the, on the questionnaire as well. So. One last update too, there's another webinar coming. These are monthly webinars. Um, so we're gonna, uh, there's gonna be a, another, another talk uh, Tuesday, November 16th. Um, and so I encourage people to continue to attend uh, all of these great webinars. And, and now I've hit a bunch of them and, and they've really been sort of fantastic discussions. So I'm gonna dive right in um, and sort of start to talk about uh, high throughput antibody discovery, specifically what we're doing at the Institute for Protein Innovation or IPI. Um, I suspect that many of you are not familiar with IPI. So let me give you a little bit of background. We are, um, we're a 501c3 nonprofit medical research organization founded in 2017 by uh, Tim Springer and, and Andy Cruz, um, both faculty members at Harvard. Um, and the purpose was to, leverage advances in protein science that have been made over the last several decades to sort of build on the, the, the foundations of genomics and, and, and start to really make advances in the protein sciences. We recognize that you know, there was all of these protein advances that have been happening, um, but they, they weren't being used in that sort of high throughput capacity to sort of address larger protein problems. Um, and we're currently focused at IPI on high throughput methods for both protein expression and purification and antibody discovery. And what I'm gonna talk about today 
is the antibody initiative at IPI. And basically um, where we, we, we started was we, we wanted to, you know, address this problem of the, of the fact that there really aren't great antibodies available for a number of protein targets. Um, so our initial goal is to create well-validated antibodies against all of the extracellular and secreted proteins in both the house and the, the human and mouse proteins. Um, you know, you know, huge project, um, going to take a number of years, but um, we, we started to develop the systems where we actually think this is possible. Um, we're, we're a nonprofit um, funded currently mostly by philanthropy, but also a number of grants and some partnerships with some biotechs. So what this allows us to do is a little bit different than, than other initiatives. We can take a sort of longer term approach to antibody discovery, um, where we're working with stakeholders, we're talking with investigators about what they need, what's the purpose of the antibody that you know, that they're trying to fulfill. And we can sort of build our discovery pipeline, you know, in collaboration with researchers, um, hoping to take advantage of our high throughput approaches. Um, we, I, I mentioned extracellular and secreted proteins. Um, this is because we are sort of fundamentally, at least at the, at the onset, targeting conformationally relevant epitopes, so epitopes on the folded epitopes on the outside of cells. Um, this lends itself to, you know, fit for purpose antibodies for things like Fax, ELISA, um, but the hope is along the way we'll also uh, discover useful antibodies for, um, for IF and Western blot and, and any other uh, applications that you might sort of envision. Um, an important part of what we're doing is all of our antibodies are synthetic, so they're molecularly defined. Um, and they're and they're replaceable, right? And they, and there's no no need for animals in, in the sort of discovery process, which allows us to be a little bit more nimble. Um, and we were set up, oh, we were set up specifically to have, and I lost that slide, um, to be focused on open science as well. Um, so here I'm going to just briefly go through our our antibody discovery pipeline. Um, it's got a number of steps. Um, we focus heavily on antigen design, antigen expression, and antigen purification. And I'll sort of go through these in a little bit more detail in a second. Um, um, once we have well-characterized antigens, um, we will move them into our sort of binder selection uh, and, and our antibody discovery uh, stages. And then this is followed at the end by sort of a high throughput antibody expression and characterization um, using mostly biophysical methods as, as I'll sort of describe in a second. Um, so I wanna walk through each of these steps a little, in a little bit more detail to give people a flavor for what we're doing in our approach. Um, we do all of our expression of mammalian cell culture. Um, this promotes native confirmations, um, maintains uh, important modifications. Um, this is generally done all robotically, so it allows us to do sort of high throughput transient transfections and, and pilot expressions, so uh, hundreds at a time on average. Um, and all of our antigens are sort of uh, tagged in a number of ways to facilitate, you know, quantitation, uh, detection, um, and a number of things. Um, and because of the high throughput nature of what we're doing, we're able to quickly sample a range of expression conditions and, um, to also try to rescue difficult antigens. So this could be any, any number of things from um, co-expressing uh, other proteins uh, to, to sort of help in, in complex formation to, to uh, additives that would sort of uh, enable uh, folded proteins on the, on, the, on the other end. And, you know, we're a, we're a small but nimble group um, and, and we're able to do what, right now a fairly large number of protein purifications. So we're, we're limited currently by, by personnel more than, more than anything, um, but we're able to in parallel purify at a large scale about 12 antigens per day. Um, and then we, uh, an important aspect of all of our protein purification is that we do a significant amount of biophysical characterization of the antigen itself. Um, uh, dynamic light scattering mass spec to make sure that the antigens are well folded um, in, in the proper oligomerization state um, so that what we're, what we're putting into our antibody selections or our, our binder selections is, is sort of biologically relevant material. And I think this is an important aspect of what we've set up. Um, 
we identify antibodies using a, a, a well-characterized yeast surface display approach. Um, our, our library is pretty similar to, to things that exist on the market. Um, we've got a number of heavy and light chains in, in our yeast, what is a fab library, um, with most of the diversity contained within the CDR3 region of, of the heavy chain. Um, we go through iterative rounds of selection to identify um, fabs that will bind to uh, the, the antigen selectively. Um, and then uh, we use next generation sequencing to, to sort of identify what those, what those molecules are. Um, and at the end, uh, reformat them as full IgGs and, and, and characterize them. I wanna sort of dive into our um, display technologies just a little bit more um, to give you a, a flavor for what we're able to do using yeast display if you're not familiar with this, with this approach. Um, like I said, our library is large. It's about 10 to 10 members. Um, so this mimics, at least in size and diversity, uh, you know, the human immune system. Um, but like I said, most of our diversity is maintained on, the, on just a single CDR3 region of, of the heavy chain, and then in the number of, of individual heavy chains and light chains that we sort of put into our library. Um, but I think the most important uh, feature of our of using a technique like yeast display or phage display is the ability to tailor selections on the fly. This is sort of what really distinguishes uh, our antibody selection from, say, an animal immunization protocol. We're able to do iterative positive and negative selections, um, looking for antibodies that bind to the target, but also antibodies that don't bind to very similar targets, right? Um, if you've, you've, you've seen, a, you've done a Western blot and gotten six bands for something, um, you know, this type of approach allows us to sort of hone in and get a specific antibody for, for a, a target. Um, we're also allowed, able to do competitive selection. So um, in addition to positive and negative selections, we can put in a, in a labeled antigen of, of choice um, and, and have an unla unlabeled competitors in the same selection to sort of um, ensure or, or not ensure, but, but try to bias our selections towards antibodies that have sort of exquisite selectivity for the, for the target that we want. Um, and I, I mean, this basically comes down to the idea that we have a lot of experimental control over um, over what we're what what we're selecting antibodies for. Um, this could also be important, um, in particular, if you're looking for antibodies for 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 immunohistochemistry or uh, techniques where you we actually want denatured antigens. We we can, in theory. Um, we can we can modify our protocol in such that we we, we introduce these you know antigens in, in this particular state to the yeast library and, and try to identify uh, only binders that would 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 bind under the sort of experimental conditions um, that you might be uh, interested in. And like I said, uh, this is an iterative process. So as we're going through our our, our yeast display uh, selections each round is actually frozen um, and we can go back to it at a later date and we can reprobe it, we can change the conditions. We don't have to start from the beginning, um, which, which offers a lot of flexibility. Um, and at the, end of the, at the end of this, what we, what we end up getting is a lot of next generation sequencing data on all of the binders, um, both binding in the positive state and in the negative state, which gives us a deeper understanding of, of how antibodies work. Um, you know, and the, and the characteristics of what would be a good reagent antibody, which we think is going to be um, extremely valuable as we as we continue to, to sort of probe um, probe targets in the future. Uh, okay, um, I just want to go into this a little bit pretty quickly, but to show you what this looks like, we start with this huge library of, of you know more than ten to the tenth members, um, and what we typically do is we then introduce a, a, a labeled antigen and, and we, we look for yeast that will bind to the antigen and we do it, two rounds of a, of a magnetic cell sorting um, to identify yeast that have um, some ability to bind to this target. Um, and at the end of, the, of these uh, magnetic cell sorting rounds, we go into a um, flow cytometry based selection for the for the more specific targets. Um, and what you can see at the top are, are sort of positive sorts, affinity sorts. So in the presence of, of antigens, 
um, and they're sort of intermixed with negative sorts on the bottom, um, where we introduce um, other types of reagents, we, we, we consider polyspecificity reagents, sticky things to basically rule out antibodies that are just non-specifically binding to particular targets. Um, like I said, we save samples from each of these sorts um, and we sequence all of them. And, and what, we, what we identify are characteristics of potentially good binders that are sort of being enriched through this process, um, getting us to antibodies with, with good properties at the end. Um, what this looks like in real life is shown here. Um, at the top of your screen are, would be the negative control for these sorts. So in the absence of, um, of any antigen, um, and what you'll see is, is very little of the, very few yeast are actually binding um, to, in, in, the, in the absence of any antigen. Um, but if you look at the bottom, the first sort is a positive sort. So with 100 nanomolar uh, antigen, and what you'll see is a population of yeast that can recognize um, recognize uh, that antigen. Um, in the subsequent negative sort, we actually we select for this for the cells that don't bind to the our polyspecificity reagent, and then as we go through iterative rounds of selection, we we um, increase the stringency of, of the of the selection. So we, we, we drop the, the, the antigen concentration to 20 nanomolar in this case, or four nanomolar in the last case, getting a population of, of yeast that bind quite tightly um, to, to this particular antigen. Um, like I said, we, we, we then take those yeast and we sequence them um, using next generation sequencing and we uncover uh, families of, of sequences, motifs um, that seem to recognize the target. Um, and like I said, we can follow this as a, as a function of uh, the different sorts that we did. So we can look for sequences that are being enriched. We can also look for sequences that are, that are um, generally or commonly found in multiple sorts. And we know those are sort of stiff, sticky or, or, or not useful sequences. And we can sort of work around those as we're developing the antibodies that go forward for further testing. Um, and generally, the most abundant representatives from our sorts will be synthesized as full IgGs for, for characterization. Um, there's a lot of subtlety in, in sort of how we pick the sequences that we, that we then characterize. Um, but importantly, we're, we're sort of, we have a large data set or a large and growing data set from all of these sorts. And, and as we get better, and do more, um, do more selections and, and, and do more antibody characterization. We're, we're learning every day, uh, you know, something about how to sort of mine this data a little bit better and a little bit further. Um, so what we get out of this, and here, so here's an example um, of sort of some of the characterization that we do is, is we get a number of antibodies. And then generally we, we, we synthesize somewhere between 12 and 24 antibodies to each target for further characterization, which is a lot. Um, but because of the, our sort of high throughput capacity, we can, we can characterize easily 384 antibodies in a week, um, which allows us to do a fair number of targets this way. Um, and um, here, this is showing uh, a, a, a fax assay. So looking at antibody binding um, to, to hex cells, or actually in this case, it's CHO cells, um, expressing uh, either the human or the mouse IGSF nine B uh, antigen, so transiently transfected, um, and these this anti this particular antigen has over ninety five percent identity. So not surprisingly, um, all almost all of these antibodies actually sort of bind to the human and mouse target relatively equally. Um, there is one antibody at the top in the middle, or two antibodies at, at the top that seem to have. Um, some selectivity for the human over the mouse. Um, generally, when we're doing our selections, we select against the human antigen. We also select against the mouse antigen, um, it, sort of as independent experiments. And then sometimes we do sort of the competitions um, with both of those to, to identify antibodies that are both cross-reactive and also antibodies that are specific particular targets. Um, uh, like I said, most of our characterization to date has been biophysical in nature. So this is an SPR experiment looking at a different set of antibodies. So these are antibodies to PDL1 and PDL2. Um, and the purpose of this is just to show you that um, you know, we get a we get a 
pretty good antibodies with pretty good specificity for the, you know for their intended target. Um, um, so on the left, showing that the three PDL1 antibodies that we tested bind to PDL1 but don't bind at all to, to PDL2. Um, and on the right, the, the reverse. Um, so you know, generally, um, our antibodies are characterized um, with a fax assay with SPR or BLI for sort of biophysical sort of recognition of the target. Um, we do Western blot testing, um, although because we're looking at folded epitopes generally, we don't have a, a lot of, of Western antibodies at the moment, but we're sort of building capabilities as we go along. One other high throughput assay I want to mention that we have developed is, 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 a, is a, uh, a high throughput polyreactivity assay. So essentially what we, we do in the course of our characterization is we look at um, we look at our antibodies and their, and their likelihood to stick to other things like DNA or insulin as just a general protein or a soluble membrane prep, which is on the, on the bottom there. And uh, we've developed this assay against a number of, of control antibodies that we know sort of are sticky or not sticky. And we can sort of see rel relatively quickly. We have great, some great antibodies that have really, you know, very specific for the target, but they just behave very poorly in this type of assay because they are nonspecific for DNA or whatever it would be. So something that would, at the end of the day, um, make it a, a poor reagent, we're able to sort of still screen that out before we, we sort of pass it on to people. Um, so uh, like I said, IPI has been around for a couple of years. We've been building up our capacity to do this. Um, where we are currently is we're doing small scale antigen expression screening of about 96 constructs a week. Um, uh, we have a slower step, which is antibody discovery, the, 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 the yeast display that I showed you where we are able to do about 22 antigens per every two weeks. Um, the, the sort of differences in some of these numbers is we often make multiple constructs to, to each antigen to find one that will express um, and, and is well behaved. You know, some of these targets that we're working at are, are sort of in, uh, inherently difficult. Um, when we get to the stage of antibody production, we're able to screen, like I said, about 384. And the full characterization for us takes two weeks. Um, and then as we get towards antibody production and distribution, we're currently able to do about 24 antibodies on large scale per week. Um, since we've started, we've, in, we've interrogated about 500 targets. Um, that's several thousand um, constructs that we, we express and purified and, and put through screening, but 500 individual uh, protein targets have been screened so far. Um, and it's 500 per year, I should say, not, not, not so far, but, um, with, with about 5,000 antibodies being screened per year. So um, um, most of our antibodies on the other end do bind in at least one assay, um, but you know they have some of them have characteristics that don't necessarily make for great reagents. They have fast off rates. They have um, you know, they're a little bit uh, polyreactive. Whatever the issue is, um, so uh, one of the the biggest limitations to where we're at right now is is actually you know finding people to do sort of further biological characterization of the antibodies that we've been making. Um, and I'll talk about that in, the, in a second. So I wanted to just give people a feel for wh wh what we've done and where we're going. Um, the early campaigns at IPI were organized by structurally similar targets. Um, we focused, you know, one because it's sort of straightforward and, and, and expression was, was, was relatively, relatively easy. And to some extent, we started with the IgG superfamily and we did several hundred targets from the IgG superfamily, um, which, uh, led us to sort of our, our next stage targets. We found that some of the most interesting targets in, in this IgG superfamily for which antibodies were needed um, were, were sort of more closely related to neurobiology or in, a, in adaptive immunity. So we've sort of been building upon the, the, our first stages into our, our sort of second uh, stages of targets, looking more specifically into these communities and, and trying to make antibodies that, that are sort of greatly needed uh, for, for researchers there. Um, we have other campaigns that are focused on, on integrins um, and wind frizzled um, that are ongoing or just beginning at this stage. Um, but the hope is 
with our capacity that we're going to be bringing on two or three or four communities every year. So we're looking for researchers, groups of researchers that have sort of a, a you know, a, a, a larger need for target for antibodies for particular targets. We want to really make a difference and, and sort of enable a research community. So we're beginning to talk with different groups about what their needs are. Um, and if we can line up the right groups of people, um, you know, who have assays ready and biological questions ready to, to, that our antibodies may actually help with, that's going to sort of feed into the next community of antibodies that IPI works on. Um, and I'll just finish here uh, before we, we take questions. Um, like I said, our, our slow step currently is, is finding collaborators to help us test our existing antibodies uh, in, in real experiments. We're, they're well, bio, they're biophysically well characterized, um, but we don't necessarily know if they'll work in IHC or uh, IF. Um, generally, our antibodies were really well in, in flow and ELISA, um, but uh, you know, everybody has sort of a particular need for their, you know, their, their, for an antibody and, and working with researchers to sort of find these fit for purpose reagents and make these fit for purpose reagents is where we're really trying to go. Um, as we're looking for these next targets, our, our sort of current criteria based on, you know, what we're good at um, is, is, you know, still focused on mammalian cell surface and secreted proteins. Um, and, and most importantly, looking for researchers that are willing to work with us, you know, start to finish, right? Um, in the design of antigens to make sure that, you know, we're, we're testing for the right region and for the right application um, and that the antibody will perform in the assay that, that, that you're thinking about. And then as we, we get antibodies on the other side that we can quickly pass them on to researchers and, 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 and have them tested. And I think that's the, uh, the real sort of test of an antibody is getting in the hands of, of of uh, researchers who sort of understand the field um, and, and can sort of say if this antibody is doing anything useful. Um, and, you know, if you want to know more about what we're doing, um, please reach out to me um, and uh, email at the bottom or just antibodies at proteininnovation.org. Um, that goes to, to me or, or my, the commercial partners in, in, within, within IPI. And I think that's all I have. So I haven't looked at the Q and A. Are there any questions? Stephen, I have a question. Um, Great. Just kind of a general question for you or maybe other panelists too. In your experience, um, for a given target and the different applications, you know, immunofluorescence, uh, Western blot, pull down, et cetera, um, how often is a single antibody good for all those purposes, or do you usually need several? <laughs> I, I feel like you plan. I planted that question. No, <laughs> no thanks, Cheryl. No, I, I think rarely, right? It rarely is one antibody going to do everything, right? We know this um, for for a number of reasons. That, um, like I said, most of our antibodies, because of the way we're making them, and the, and um, you know, they work really well in facts because we do all of our selections using, you know, using facts. Um, but they, they're pretty, maybe 20% work in Western blot. And when we actually go and probe and try to figure out why, it's usually because that antigen was aggregated. <laughs> it was unfolded when it went into the sorts, at least at some level. Um, so that makes perfect sense at some level that if you, if you need to recognize an unfolded epitope or whatever it is, you need to start with that material or you need to have it present. And so, yeah, no, our expectations are, you know, you're going to need two, three, four antibodies to sort of run across most of the applications that you'd want. And in many cases, like ELISA or a single molecule sort of ELISA, um, you need two, right? You often need pairs. And, um, and so th there's gonna be a need to have to multiple antibodies to, to individual targets. And then, um, you know, one thing that's not mentioned here in terms of reagents, you know, if you wanted to have these antibodies to be functional in any way or block function, um, you know, finding that antibody among amongst the tools is, is gonna be sort of, uh, a challenge as well. So you, it, that, that's one of the reasons why we're, do, we're generally doing at least testing 24 um, and for important or really valuable targets or whatever. We've made, we've made over a hundred antibodies in some cases to specific and just trying to 
learn more about how and why they bind to, you know, along a particular antigen. Um, oh, good. My, my buddy Carl at, at Icarus has added something we've tested. 350, so Carl at, at Icarus, so, and so for people who don't know, Icarus is, is doing antibody characterization um, of all sorts of commercial antibodies. Um, and he writes, we've, we've, we've tested 350 antibodies by Western blot, IP, and IF, and only 10 to 15 of those antibodies performed well in all three applications. So that, that's sort of uh, independent verification uh, uh, from Icarus, that it, whatever, whatever that percentage is, like <laughs> less than 5% of antibodies perform across Western blot, IP, and IF. And I, I believe that. I think that's uh, pretty fair. Any other questions before I turn things over? So, okay, great. So we'll, we'll, again, we'll have, a, we'll have more of a discussion at the end, but I wanna uh, move things over to Simona Colantonio from Frederick National Lab, uh, from the Antibody Characterization Lab, at, 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 for, where she's the Director of, of, of Antibody Characterization. Um, Simona, I'll let you take over. You're on mute as well. <laughs> yeah, I know. I learned from the best. So thank you for the opportunity of being here. My name is Simona Colantoni. I'm the director of the Frederick Nation of the, I wish, of the NCI Antibody Characterization Lab. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about the NCI antibody program. I'll give you an overview, and then I'll make some consideration about antibody development and antibody characterization strategies, which is basically what we do at the, uh, at the ACL. So if you have never heard about the NCI antibody program, just know that basically there are three major phases in this program. The first one is basically collecting requests from the scientific community. Um, then we will vet this quest, this request, and uh, uh, there will be basically a um, subcontract to uh, external company to, to actually produce the antibodies. And uh, the final step is the characterization of these antibodies at the ACL. Uh, so I'm going to give you a little bit more details about this. Uh, once a year, we have a general call out. Uh, the next one should be in the spring of 2022. Uh, so far, we have developed uh, two, uh, eight, more than 800 antibodies, uh, but more are on the pipeline already. So when we collect this uh, request from the scientific community, those requests will be vetted, will be screened by an external scientific committee. I do not belong to that committee. and. Uh, and basically, they have to make sure that the, the requests fulfill the criteria that uh, they will require. First of all, they have to be cancer-related target. And there has to be no antibody already available for that target. Or if there are antibodies commercially available for that target, that um, those antibodies that might not work in the specific application that the, the investigator we work with has in mind. Then there is the whole phase of production, screening, selection, characterization, which is followed by the um, basically the distribution phase. We have dual mechanism of distribution. Uh, the major one is through the DSHP uh, of the University of Iowa. DSHP stands for, um, mm, oh my God. <laughs> I can't remember right now. I have a blank in my head, but anyway. So I'll get back, I'll not come back to me. Anyway, so, and uh, all the data, negative and positive data will be published in our antibody portal. So if you go to the to this website, antibody.cancer.gov, you will find, you will be able to search our database of antibody. You will be able to, to query by antibody, antigen characterization. And what's also very convenient, and you can actually, uh, uh, purchase the antibody, clicking on the little icon that looks like a cart, and that will directly will direct you to the DSHB website. And the, the cost of those antibodies is extremely limited because it's a, a cost. To give you just a, an idea of what kind of prices we're looking at, 
um, like one ml of a subordinatum or a mouse subordinatum, which would be definitely enough for you to at least make sure that the, the antibody works in, for you, it would be $40. So definitely not the commercial prices you look around. So let me give you some information about the antibody development. Uh, the project that have been approved, that will be assigned to a mouse or rabbit vendor, depending on the characteristic of the antigen itself. Um, you know, for give you just an example, if we have a, a protein that is highly conserved between mouse and human, which is a common case, we're probably going to go into a rabbit rather than mouse. Um, there is an initial larger screening, which is done by the vendor itself and, uh, and based on the indirect ELISA. And basically this screen has the scope to identify the clones that show reactivity against our antigen. So if the title of those uh, uh, clones are good, then the clones are isolated and screened. At this point, we can already introduce uh, a counter screening strategy. For example, if you're raising an antibody that is against the phosphorylated peptide, we will definitely do also uh, screen the antibody against the corresponding non-phosphorylated antigen so that we know if the antibody is phospho-specific or if the antibody is able to recognize both the, um, the antigen in its phosphorylated and non-phosphorylated form. One thing we really want to uh, uh, to emphasize is the need for a fit for purpose. And this, I think Steve, Steve also mentioned this. Um, so we encourage our collaborator to screen the, uh, the initial screening material that they receive from the vendor directly with the end use application, because this will basically guarantee that the final product will work in the application. One thing that we have to keep in mind that with bad antibodies might actually be the wrong antibody because you, at the end of the day, you get what you scream for. If, for example, you get uh, you develop an antibody for Western blot, uh, Western blot, as we know, the protein has to be completely unfolded in the nature, that not, not necessarily means that that antibody that might be a stellar antibody for Western blot will work in another application that instead requires the antibody to recognize the protein in its native state. Like I'm thinking about an IP, for example. It's in, so once the antibody has been, uh, uh, you know, selected uh, uh, um, and purified, we will receive it at the ACL, and then we will start our characterization process. So I'm gonna talk about some critical step in the character, so some critical consideration aspect of the characterization. First of all, and uh, it is the importance of the material that we use for the screening. We always start with a recombinant protein, whatever possible, whatever it makes sense, uh, just for a general uh, uh, idea of how the antibody works. Especially if we raise antibody against peptide, we definitely want to know if the antibody will be able to recognize the full length protein, which is now granted, obviously. In the absence of the ability to have a recombinant protein, because we do not make our own a recombinant protein, so we have to rely on either on the collaborators or on um, you know, commercial available proteins, we, will, we could go into transfected cells, like we would use transfected cells. Although I have to say the ideal case scenario as to, would be like having a pair of wild type versus knockout cells, which will be the optimum, but not necessarily that's the easiest way to, to work. I mean, it, it will be kind of challenging to have that. Uh, sometimes we have to treat the cells to induce maybe uh, the specific protein expression, or maybe activate the pathway, increase a, a post translational modification. One example, which I'm going to show you in a little bit, would be about radiation. We use the radiation to bring up the, uh, um, the phosphorylation in a certain kind of target. We also have explored 3D cell, uh, 3D cell culture. Uh, it's definitely a possibility at the ACL for small scale study, but there are limitations uh, with, the, with the 3D cell culture at this time. We really emphasize on the endogenous recognition testing. And um, so if specific positive and negative control are not available, then we go and search one by one our target to find information and we to come out basically with a panel of cells that most likely would be expressing that specific target. Or if we know that that target is related to a specific disease, 
then we will look into cell lines that represents that disease. We have many cell lines we can access to, we have access to, and uh, especially we have all the NCI panel. And since we also test our antibodies in uh, IHC, in immunohistochemistry, then of course we will have to rely also on uh, tissue testing. This is one of the examples I wanted to show you. This target, CREP P2, was expected to be secreted, and we knew that it was related to ovarian cancer. Uh, so we selected four cell lines from the ovarian cancer panel, and since we knew that it was expected to be secreted, we don't all, didn't only uh, screen the lysate, well, screen also the corresponded pseudonaven. And uh, this antibody, which is CPTC CREP P2-2, uh, was, uh, you know, it was proven that he was able to recognize the target protein of about 16 kilodalton, both in the lysate and in the suvernate. Like I said, we have access to the, uh, to all the NCI 60 protein, and we use that in the say that uh, as a well-based uh, protein array. This is an example of what the data from in this part uh, of what the data uh, from the um, from an NCI 60 uh, protein array say looks like. The green bars represents the cell, are, you know, are corresponded to the cells in the panel, uh, this, the uh, all expression of that target. And everything that is positive at the, at the NCI 60 protein array will be screened in IHC. And then this particular antibody, NME1-2, was screened on a, a TMA core of uh, lung cancer, and the brown stain showed that definitely there was some binding there. Uh, this is the whole range of applications that we have at the, at the ACL, that are available at the ACL. When possible, and when it makes sense, we try to subject our antibody to everything that we have. Uh, but obviously there had to be some rationale behind, you know, what technique to use. And um, definitely one of the big one is the availability of the screening material. That's, you know, if we don't have the screening material, obviously that technique would not be able to, the proper screening material, I should say, might, might not be possible. And there are also other uh, consideration we might have, uh, basically there might be, uh, um, limitation based on the molecular weight for specific application. This basically what I'm trying to say, what we do with our antibody, we provide a customized, a customized characterization. This is an example of uh, clones, the 39 clones that were raised against strictly peptides uh, because the scope of these uh, clones were to be uh, uh, applied in, in a technique that is mass spec based, it's immuno MRM is called. So when we took these 39 clones, we screened them against the recombinant protein. Uh, we noticed that 41% were responded uh, against the uh, recombinant protein, 60% were not. This is, uh, this is the typical ratio that we see for immuno MRM antibodies. So it's not surprising at all. Uh, then the 16 antibodies basically were positive, were screened again at the Western blood lysate level. And with those, we're very, we were very pleased to see that basically the vast majority of them give like very uh, good results in, even at the endogenous level, which basically this test allows us to also to identify the cell line that do express that particular target so that we can go and maybe test other application. In this case, I'm reporting the results of the screen of the line of the, of the 16, oh, sorry, sorry, one, go back. Of the 16 antibodies that were testing, 11 basically passed to the next step, which is the single cell Western block. The single cell Western block technique, which is very useful, but it, it's kind of into like a high bar application. That means that not a whole lot of antibody will work for this, but when they work, they work very well and they give you a whole lot of information. I'll show you later what they look like. Um, like I say, Western blot, we do Western blot basically on everything that we have. Um, and uh, because for one, because it's basically the application that most, I mean, everybody wants to know. 
And also, because it gives also already an idea about the behavior of our antibody, at least in general. Of course, we, nothing will replace the actual empirical data. So you can assume, you can think about something, but you have to prove it. So this particular antibody, which is a check one antibody, uh, show very good response at the, at the, in the Western block, both at the recombinant level and the cell lysate level, both in the traditional and the automatic uh, version of the antibody, which is the West. So we thought, well, if it works so well, maybe we'll work on IF. And sure enough, when we test in IF, we have very beautiful data. And uh, we can say basically that this, pro this antibody is able to recognize the target protein even in IF. There are also other considerations we make. And for example, um, West, and which is the automated Western blot, and the single cell Western blot, they do share similar technology. Because the, at some point in both these techniques, uh, the protein will be cross-linked to the matrix, either of the capillary uh, in the West or in the slide of the single cell Western blot. In the example that I'm showing here, you will see that the CDK7 target protein was identified in clearly in LCL57, HeLa, and mcf 10 a So when, since, like we say, this uh, the technology that is in the single cell Western blood is similar, it made sense to test this uh, at the single cell Western blood. So in the single cell Western blood, not only we were able to confirm the, the presence of the target protein in the three cell lines that we uh, that I just mentioned, but we also get other information that are interesting for somebody who's actually doing some biological study, uh, like relative expression, percent of self expressed the target CDK7, and also average expression of the CDK7 per cell. I want to give you another couple of, of example of how we can prove molecular specificity of our antibody. If you remember, I was mentioning sometimes we have to treat our cells to bring up like something. In this case, we are talking about phosphorylation. This antibody in this first panel uh, was raised against uh, a trip, phosphorylated triptych peptide for NUMA1. So when we tested this against the recombinant protein, we had zero response. Um, but we didn't give up on that because we knew by, from the mass spec screening that those that this particular antibody was actually phospho-specific. So we did this phospho-specificity test in which we compare uh, uh, the Western blot between the cells that were treated, they were radiated versus cells that were not irradiated. And we can see clearly signal in the in irradiated cells rather than in not irradiated cells. And what uh, it's also very convincing, at least for me, is that both the results were obtained not just in the traditional Western blot, but we have also confirmation in the West. The other example that to show like molecular specificity of antibody is this antibody that was raised against a peptide that is common to all the keratin group B proteins. And uh, uh, which means that when we tried this antibody in the Western blot, we didn't only see one band, but as we expected, we see several bands because like I say, we are not picking up one individual protein, we are picking up a series of protein from the keratin group. And uh, again, we have very perfect correspondence between the results we get on one platform against the results that we get with the other platform, which to me adds very much a level of um, confidence in the data that we obtain. So in other words, what we try to do at the, at the NCI-ACL, we're trying to obtain high quality affinity reagents. So we will have to go through a careful immunogen selection and then the proper assignment to the, to the animal model. The fit for purpose approach is an absolutely important to obtain very good antibodies at the end. And the screening material is fundamental. Now, what we do is to uh, basically what the work that we do at the ACL, we add value to these antibodies because we characterize, we, we, we explore all the potential application that we have in our hands so that you know that the value of the antibody increases. 
So if you go to antibodycancer.gov, you can look at the results. And like I say, it's also important that we also indicate whenever it's negative and we test it and it's negative, it will show up. It will say what well, doesn't work in Western blood or in this or in that. And, and if you like what you see, you can still purchase through the DSHP website. So just want to really quickly thank all the people that make this possible, all the people from my lab. Um, and also, we also have people that work in the project manager side because we have a lot of, you might imagine, a lot of interaction with the vendors. And obviously, my counterpart of the NCI, which is Dr. Dr. Rilke and Henry Rodriguez, uh, which is the, the one that help, makes this happen every way. Anyway, that's all I have. And uh, if you have Great. any questions, let me know. Simona, there's one question so far that in the Q&A, and, and I actually sort of was thinking similarly. I mean, I think it might be sort of surprising for people, um, you know, that you can do Western blots multiple different ways and get different answers, right? Yes. <laughs> so, um, so the one, you know, one of the questions is essentially why why would you expect that the West and the in the Western blot wouldn't correlate? Like, you know, I think everybody they are can... very difficult. They are very different application. So, first of all. They're very difficult application. I mean, the base is the same. We are still trying to separate the protein base on their uh, size, and then and then we probe them. But there is, you know, once the traditional Western blot, you do that uh, uh, on, uh, you know, the SDS page gel. Then you transfer out the membrane. You all know that you probe the membrane. In the West, the technique is completely different. But, because we have basically our protein that goes through a capillary that is coded with a specific uh, uh, matrix. At the end of this, there is a, a UV light that cross link all the protein to the capillary. And then you probe with the primary and the secondary antibody that flow through the capillary. So technically, even though they're still, it's still called Western blot, not necessarily everything that works in the Western blot will work in the West and same thing. Not everything will work in the West, will work in the Western blood. That's the good. West gives you a lot of advantages, whatever it works, because you can potentially, even you don't only see this virtual blood, like the one that I showed, you also have like an electrophorogram, so you can actually even do a sort of quantitative analysis. It's a much more sophisticated approach, but um, challenging sometimes. And so, just yeah. a, fo a follow up to that. Do you find then that things that work in West more likely work in something like IF or or IHC or not necessarily? No, I see. We see more correlation between the uh, the West and the single cell Western blot because they have they share the same te technology of the cross linking. Uh, but generally, um, I would say the Western blot is a good base to see things like IF or even IHC and things like that. But like I say, nothing can substitute the actual empirical experiment. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, they're good. You know, we have to, given the size, even though we are not like a really large output, you know, program, but we still have a lot of antibody and, uh, you know, it's not the, Plus, sometimes it doesn't really make sense to do a certain kind of uh, test. And there's another sort of add-on to uh, about West or a question about West. In the, how much does it increase your throughput compared to like just it traditional? It does. Work? It does because in three hours we can screen 25 clones. Oh wow! Three hours at 25 clones, and um, instead for you know traditional Western blood. Uh, plus, we do overnight incubation for the traditional Western blood, so it's a little bit. But we still like the Western blood because West is. I mean, it's relatively common, but it's not super common. And it's everybody likes to have the Western blood data. Great. Well, so I want to get to our last speaker. So we have time again, also for a panel at the end. Um, our last speaker, Megan Rigo comes to us from AdGene, who you may not may or may not know actually is, is interested in ad antibodies. So um, I'm going to turn things over to, to Megan. Thank you. Just share my screen. All right. Can everyone see it? Great. So thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here talking about the future of antibody sharing 
and where adgene fields will fit in with this. So I wanna start by talking a little bit about antibodies today. So antibodies today are absolutely fundamental basic research tools. Anyone who's trying to identify, locate, isolate, or quantify a specific protein is likely using an antibody to do that. So on the left, you'll see a beautiful image of a rat hit the campus, and there's an antibody against new two in green. So you can see nice localization of that target protein in contrast to the myelin in red and DNA in blue. And on the right-hand side, I just have an example of an IP where you can have a mixture of proteins in red, blue, and green. And if you have an antibody that's specific for the red, you can pull out that protein as well as immune complexes. And the antibody market right now is huge. About $1.6 billion is spent globally on antibodies, 800 million alone in the US, and half of that is being spent on bad antibodies. And by bad antibodies, I mean they're poorly defined, they have poor or no characterization, they might recognize off targets or they might just not work. And we believe that a lot of this is due to a lack of transparency where customers just don't know what they're getting. There's almost never any sequencing information available for the antibodies. Antibody catalogs can change, companies can close. So sometimes if you're trying to reproduce an experiment from an older paper, you might not even be able to find the antibody that they used anymore. And this is leading to a severe problem with reproducibility. And essentially what's happening is that the companies are completely empowered and the scientists aren't. Uh, scientists have to have antibodies to just do their basic research experiments. They don't have any other options. And there's really not the pressure on the companies to change their practices. And when most people think about antibodies today, they tend to think about polyclonal and monoclonal antibodies. So polyclonal, you usually think about a rabbit that's being immunized and you isolate the immunoglobulins from their serum. The problem with this is once you run out of that a lot, you'll re-immunize that rabbit and the immunoglobulins that you get might change from immunization to immunization. So that might lead to reproducibility problems. And this was sort of addressed with the advent of hybridomas. So hybridomas, you take a mouse, you immunize them and you'll isolate a spleen cell, fuse it to a hybridoma cell or a myeloma cell to make this hybridoma line. And the beauty of hybridomas is that they're producing a single antibody. So you'll have that lot to lot consistency, but they can be hard to store they obviously will require cryogenic storage. Every time you need that antibody, you might have to thaw it. And cell lines can be lost over time. Moreover, most people aren't sequencing their hybridomas. So although you do get that nice lot to lot consistency, you still don't know exactly what you're using. And in contrast to this, we have recombinant monoclonal antibodies. So these are plasmid-based tools that you'll transfect into a cell line. It could be HEC, CHO, or something similar and you end up expressing the proteins. And because it's based off of a single plasmid, you end up with one protein and nice lot to lot consistency. And it's ethical, so it doesn't require the use of an animal, which is a nice advantage. Because it's based off of a plasmid, it's also molecularly defined. You'll know the sequence of it. And because you know the sequence of it, it's easily stored. You don't even need the physical material anymore at that point. You can just share a sequence with somebody. They can have it synthesized and clone it into whatever plasmid they want. And also because it's sequenced is defined, it can be easily engineered or improved. So you can use bioinformatics or uh, computer modeling to look at a sequence and say, well, if I want this desirable characteristic, maybe I can make this change. And it kind of fuels, fuels um, technology forward. And if you really look at the literature for the past five or 10 years, it really seems like it's becoming the age of recombinant antibodies. So more and more you're seeing researchers calling for standardization of antibody validation. They think that people should be switching to recombinants to ease the reproducibility crisis. And there's an urging of funding agencies and journals alike to push people to make this a requirement. But when you look at what's out there, there isn't a whole lot of open antibody resources. So as Simone mentioned, there's a DSHB, which is a fantastic resource for hybridomas. But as I mentioned before, hybridomas have the one downside that they're not being sequenced widespread. So you still might not know what you're getting. So this year, Agene received funding from the NIH to create an open access recombinant affinity reagent resource that we're calling NEIGHBOR. So this stands for the Neuroscience Antibody Open Resource. And the idea here is that we're gonna start with a catalog of neuroscience focused antibody tools, and then we can expand it later into other fields. 
So I want to talk a little bit about Adgene's vision for neighbor. Now, if you're not familiar with Adgene, we're a nonprofit and our mission is to accelerate research and discovery by improving access to useful materials and information. And we have a nice self-sustaining model. So scientists can deposit their plasmid with us for free. And what we'll do is we'll run quality control on it, sequence it, and then for a small fee, we'll ship it to scientists all over the world. And the fee that they pay helps keep Adgene uh, running and helps us to start new initiatives. And because we're a plasmid repository, it lends itself really nicely to other plasmid-based tools. So in 2016, we started making a subset of our um, viral encoding plasmids into ready to, ready to use viruses and started shipping those to scientists. And that saves scientists the time of having to make the viruses on their own. And starting this year, we're doing the same for recombinant antibodies, where we're making a subset of the recombinant antibody expressing plasmids in our collection as ready to use proteins. And starting next year, we'll start offering them to the scientific community. And I should stress too, we're not making scientists buy the ready to use proteins. The plasmids are still available. So if they have the facilities and the know-how to make these tools on their own, they can certainly do that. Some adjunct fast facts, if you're not familiar with us, we're headquartered in Boston, Massachusetts with about hundred employees. And we have satellite office in the UK, as well as distributors in China, Japan, Korea, and India. And we have deposits from 4,500 labs and over 100,000 plasmids in our collection. And each year we distribute about 200,000 samples, over half of which are going internationally. And to date, 15 Nobel Prize winners have distributed their materials via Adgene. So in our vision, we hope that Neighbor is going to provide scientists with the access to plasmid sequences and ready to use proteins validation through quality control and crowdsource functional characterization, which I'll talk a little bit about later, and education to improve protocols and promote successful use. So a lot of um, the energy at Adgene is spent on maintaining our website. So like any website that has a catalog, you'll see information about what it is that you're purchasing. So here as an example, I just have one of the CRISPR plasmids. So you'll see the plasmid and the lentiviral preps are available. But in addition to the information about the items that our catalog offers, we also have a website that's rich in other information. So this can be blog posts, protocols, videos. Essentially, we don't just want to provide scientists with the physical material. We want to provide them with the know-how so that they're successful with their experiments. And our website gets about 2.5 million page views per month and 200,000 uh, users. And we also stress quality control. Obviously, we need to make sure that scientists are getting exactly what they think they're getting. So all samples that come in and leave Adgene are barcoded and tracked in our laboratory information management system. And all of the plasmids that come in undergo uh, full plasmid sequencing by NGS. And those sequences are open online. So scientists, even before you order your plasma from Adgene, you can look at those sequence and make sure that it's exactly what you want it to be. So for our neighbor collection, the QC has to be a little bit different. Obviously, it's not as simple to sequence a plasmid, uh, excuse me, an antibody as it is to sequence a plasmid. So we're going to be working very closely with Dr. James Trimmer at UC Davis. So Dr. Trimmer has an extensive collection of neuroscience-focused hybridomas called the Neuromab Collection. And he's been systematically converting his hybridoma lines over to recombinant antibodies. And he's already deposited hundreds of these into Adgene and he's routinely depositing even more. So we're gonna be starting by making a subset of his materials into ready to use recombinant proteins and then sending them back to the trimmer lab where they're gonna conduct quality control and make sure that the recombinants are functioning as they would expect the hybridoma. So they're gonna do head to head experiments and look at the, function, the functioning of the proteins and the potency. But we recognize that as a nonprofit, we don't have unlimited resources. So we expect that we're going to need to work very closely with the community to help build out this characterization. And we'd like to base this off of our AAV data hub. So right now online, we have this data hub where Agene can uh, collect feedback and information from scientists who used our AAV particles. So scientists can upload um, protocols, data, results, and all of this information is made open for other scientists to go in and take a look. And we think that this will lend itself really well to antibody characterization data. We can have users and trusted partners and kind of collect and curate and share this information. 
So I should say too, this isn't a free for all where you can just upload anything. You'll be all working very closely with an ad gene scientist to make sure that the experiments that are posted have all of the proper controls and all of the information that would be needed for another scientist to replicate the experiment. And we also want both positive and negative data. We'd like people to tell us if an antibody doesn't work for a specific uh, application or for a specific species so that other scientists aren't wasting their resources on it. And our target launch date for the physical material is gonna be quarter one of 2022. And we anticipate that the antibody data hub will come later in the year. So what could the future of antibodies look like? So we anticipate that there's gonna be a a few challenges. And the first of that is probably going to be around intellectual property. So in general, people are uncomfortable with the thought of sharing antibodies. Specifically, there's a lot of concern over sequences being open, because once they're open, they can be used without your consent. And there's also expectations among technology transfer offices and research institutions for royalties, which you don't see as often with plasmids. So there's a big question of how do we change the comfort level that the community has with sharing these materials? How do we change the expectation for financial incentives? There's also the question of inventory management. How do we best build this catalog? We want to, we want to fulfill the unmet need in the scientific community, but we also don't want to make antibodies that are just going to be sitting in the freezer because the, you know, so few people actually need them. We also need to balance low cost and high quality. We'd love to do every single application for every single antibody, but we just don't have the resources to do that. You know, the more QC you do on something, it's going to increase the cost. And we understand that funding can be difficult for some labs and we need to keep costs as low as possible. And finally, we anticipate that it might be difficult to change the status quo for antibody distribution. And we've encountered this before. So when AdGene first started, there was resistance to sharing plasmids so openly. And it really took a few super plasmid depositors who are passionate about open science, who made their materials available to set that bar for what plasmid sharing should be. And eventually over time, it really became the norm. So we're hoping that with this neighbor collection, and if we can get a few super depositors working with us, we can do the same thing for antibodies where we can just change the expectation and propel science so that people are sharing their antibodies openly. I wanna talk for one minute about the community comfort with sharing sequences. Um, we understand it is a huge concern for people and in an effort to offset those concerns, we're actually um, instituting a terms essentially for the sequences for antibody expressing plasmids. So if you're on AdGene's website and you're interested in an antibody expressing plasmid and you wanna look at the sequence, our website's actually gonna prompt you to log in. And once you log in, you're going to have to accept an affinity reagent sequencing policy, which essentially says that you understand that this is for informational purposes only, and you can't use these sequences for commercial use. So we hope that by having this, labs will be more comfortable with the idea of sharing their plasmids through AdGene. So what's the outlook? What would your ideal community antibody resource look like? Well, at AdGene, we believe that antibodies should be easy to store indefinitely, easy to share globally, and easy to improve. We also understand that any kind of a collection that we build needs to be financially self-sustaining and stable. It will do the community no good if five and 10 years, you run out of funding and these reagents are no longer available. And we need to have excellent scientific support and resources so that scientists aren't just getting physical reagents, they're getting the know-how of how to use them properly. And we need the information to be open and transparent and easily accessible. We also want our collection to have useful tools and well-characterized tools. And we believe that it needs to be a partnership with different journals and granting institutions and other organizations to facilitate the information flow. And as a potential roadmap for how we can get there, well, the fact that recombinants are molecularly defined already addresses the first three of these ideals. They can be shared indefinitely. They can easily be shared globally and they're easy to improve. At AdGene, we've already built a self-sustaining and stable model, and we believe that recombinant antibodies will fit in very well into this model. We have a website that uh, offers scientific support and educational resources that we're already building out for antibodies. And in everything that we do, we hope that we're being open and transparent. 
And for the last part, we really need it to be a collaboration between depositors and community and other organizations. We want to make sure that we have useful tools. This could be maybe a push to start sequencing more hybridomas so that people know exactly what they're using. We want the tools to be well characterized. So maybe we start working with trusted partners who are experts in a particular assay and going to that lab that does that technique in that one specific way to validate the, our antibodies and make sure that we're doing things the right way. And then finally, in order to change the status quo, everyone's really gonna to have to partner together with journals and granting institutions and other organizations to try to push for a change where antibodies are open and available to everybody. So at this point, I can take any questions that people might have. Sorry, I'm looking at the chat. Um, Megan, I have a question. I mean, so we've had discussions about about this, uh, and you know, this is very much in line with what IPI is trying to do with, with you know, with our recombinant or our synthetic antibodies. You know, so um, the I, I the the sequence issue is is important, and I think you guys have sort of addressed that right in in, a, in from the IP perspective. Um, but I, I wonder also though, like, so, and maybe this is for more for people in attendance. Um, one of our concerns as we, if we've thought about this, I mean, making our antibodies available, making the plasmids available that people would make them themselves. Um, you know, do you think most labs or many labs will have that expertise? To, to do that well. Um, and and my, our concern or my concern has been, um, you know, with, with, with the antibodies or it, it's it, the, we already know that they don't work in lots of applications. And I don't wanna add necessarily an, an additional factor, which may be, you know, was, was the antibody produced well in in the end lab, right? Because it, it's not trivial necessarily to, to produce your own antibodies. Um, and, and I worry about adding in extra um, extra layers to that. Did, I mean, maybe, maybe the question maybe then is with with the viruses that you guys did, did you did you have that problem? Like, or did you ever see differences from um, starting with you know, first just the vectors, but then also, you know, the, the full virus. So do people have a preference? And, and, and then was there lots, what was part of the reason you switched to viruses because people were having issues uh, producing it themselves? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. So for viruses, it's very split. So for lentiviral, people will generally make that on their own with the exception of libraries. And I think that is, as you mentioned, it's technically challenging to make sure that when you amplify your library, you're getting good representation. So for things like libraries, we see that people will tend to buy, buy it from Agene rather than have to make it for themselves. Whereas for AAV, which is pretty technically challenging to make, the plasmids themselves are not popular, not particularly popular, but the ready to made virus is super popular. So again, people understand the difficulty of having to make it and likely don't want to make it on their own. And the labs that we've talked to, you know, we haven't really met too many labs that are keen on making these things on their own, it seems like I, I believe that the preference might be to get the ready to made, uh, ready made particles rather than making it on their own. Um, we do like to offer that to people though, because we understand, you know, finances can be difficult. So in that case, at least for the stuff we produce, we put our exact protocols online, but you will sometimes get a technical support question with a person that's not following the protocol the exact way. And kind of the response to that is, I'm very sorry, it's not working, but you need to follow the protocol the exact way that it's written in order to get the same result. Great. No, that's really, I think that's good. So we actually have about, as intended, about 10 or 15 minutes left. So to, to sort of maybe broaden this discussion and sort of talk at a, um, a slightly different level about, you know, open source antibody tools start to finish and how to make this work, um, you know, on, on a large scale, you know, to the scale sort of consistent with, with, you know, the mission or the idea behind target 2035, like, how do we actually do this? Um, how do we make antibodies to all these targets that are useful in all of the applications that people 
need or don't even know that they need yet? Um, and, and, and how do we make this workable? Um, and uh, I would encourage people, if there's anybody left on the line who what sort of has questions around surrounding this in any way to sort of to add on, but um, maybe a good place to start would be, you know, what do you guys think is the biggest challenge, you know, it, to, towards sort of hitting this mission of target 2035 of, of all of the, you know, all of the human proteins? Uh, how, how do we do this from your perspective? What's the, what's the biggest challenge? Simona, you want to, you want to start maybe you're having some connection issues. So I want to get you while you're here. Yeah, no, 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 no. What happened? I I'm logging in from the phone right now because my <laughs> just uh, dropped on me. It's new. It's not even a week old, but anyway. Um, yeah. Well, the challenge is probably the volume of, of, of uh, target. I mean, of proteins that we need to, uh, so it would be the challenge would be to optimize, you know, the uh, the way in which we produce antibodies and the way we characterize them. Like, to, but sometimes, um, you know, that you you have to make compromise. I guess when you do those things, we we mentioned before, like while especially for the characterization side, which is what I do. Uh, wild type versus knockout. Obviously, that's the best, but it, it is it is challenging to get that. Uh, uh, especially, it's challenging to get that expertise all in one place. I mean, we can do all the characterization that we can do, but to go into manipulation of cells, doing. I mean, I I don't know anything about it, and I'm not willing to get into that. But you know, somebody else that wants. I guess the, the concept that I'm trying to say that it has to be since the volume of anti or, or, or proteins that we have to characterize is so large, the best way to do it will be to do a common effort. Everybody with their own specialized you know, field, I cannot, you know, I cannot do whatever you do or whatever Megan does, but, and I think you might have challenges in, in the what I do. And by the way, I really, uh, now, Going back to Megan's talk, uh, which I'm sorry that I lost the last five minutes, but um, the the sequencing is definitely like the best way to go. And we found for we have like I say mostly mouse and, and rabbit monoclonal. Um, when at the beginning of the rabbit effort that came after the mouse, there was more hybridoma. Uh, but we, we, when we have the opportunity, we actually translate all this hybridomus rabbit into sequence, because we know that you know that there is is less the I, mouse, rabbit hybridoma that seems to be less stable than the mouse. So, um, but that actually is very uh, uh, um, is very useful. We also have some mouse that have been sequencing. And it's very useful because sometimes you can make this chimera antibodies in which you have like, you know, because the, the, the epitope binding portion of the antibody should be the same, but then you can change the other portion of the antibody. So we have, for example, antibodies that we raise against mouse target, they work very well, but when they try to use those in, uh, Mm, IHC in a mouse tissue, then you have a lot of background. So what we did, we re-expressed that mouse in a rabbit, sorry, that mm, uh, mouse rabbit in a rabbit scaffold, and that took care of all the non-specific binding. So I think that, that, I think that is an absolutely yeah critical factor of, of if you've got recombinant synthetic antibodies, you can you can play with the sequence. And I think Megan sort of pointed to that at some point. You could. You could try well, to maybe even do a humanized antibodies mm -hmm. or whatever, you know, if you have that need or, you know, so sequences are, are definitely, uh, I think we're going to get there eventually. It's just like you say, it's changing the culture might be the, ch the main challenge for that. Megan, because, from your perspective, uh, what do you think? What do you, what do, what do you think is a, <laughs> the biggest challenge, if there is a biggest challenge? I think validation is probably the biggest challenge. I'd say validation and changing the mindset of antibody uh, sharing. But we, I think we, everybody here understands that knockout is what we should all be doing for validation. But there's 
sim it's simply so expensive. You know, if you have 800, 900 targets, you know, where's the money going to come from to do all of that validation? Um, and the time that would take to do and that. The time, and it might mean crowdsourcing, like finding people that already have these animals and these tissues in their freezer that they're willing to donate and share to the efforts, um, working with different groups that have, as Simone said, have the expertise um, to do these things, because one lab can't do everything. Yeah, and from my, from my perspective, I, I, I mean, I'm totally in totally agreement that validation characterization is this is the slow step for sure, right? It, it, it's, we, I think we could fix it, but it, but the, the other one that sort of I guess scares me, or we've come up against it a number of times in sort of starting this, is um, it's almost history in a sense um, that there have been so many past initiatives to try to make large numbers of antibodies, so large numbers of targets that have been um, for one reason or another, what I would call sort of relatively unsuccessful, right? In the sense that they haven't that they haven't solved the problem of then they made hundreds of really specific tar antibodies to those targets in this cert. That a lot of the the funding agencies or you right. know NIH or whatever it would be have sort of lost their appetite to to um, endorse or back these larger initiatives to to make. To, to make and organize people to do, you know, just the type of thing we're talking about, right? Like, because, you know, does there have to be some incentive to get people to, to screen 20, 30, 40 antibodies to a single target to find the one that works in a really important, but very specific application? I don't know. Um, one, one addition from, from, the, from the attendees, uh, and I think this is valid and important as well, this is one of the biggest challenges is there's you know, about two and a half million commercial antibodies, which we know about half of them are already are nonspecific. So, <laughs> so like, how do we deal with the historical aspects of, uh, of, of all of these antibodies that are out there that people have been using that may or may not, may or may not work well. And I mean, do, do people have thoughts on, on that aspect of this? Um, I ran up against this a long time ago when, when I was when I was characterizing histone antibodies um, and, and sort of talking about the non-specificity and of, of you know modification specific antibodies. Um, and, and, and that's a sort of continuing challenge to do well um, technically, but also dealing with the existing antibodies that are on the market. Yeah, maybe, maybe I'll just further endorse the concept of crowdsourcing, sharing open data, just as uh, I think the, the thing you've set up at Adgene is, is a brilliant way to address this where people can use the reagent and then upload their data to show um, how it works or, or, or their own validation. Um, and the, the issue of changing the culture around the expectation that, um, you know, I made an antibody and now I wanna get some return for it. Um, it's true there's a, there's a history there, but there also has been in, uh, in small molecule space where, where we're working and we're trying to change that culture where you know, these initial tools are so important for the wider research community that um, we wanna encourage the concept of uh, creating the tool, making it available for uh, sort of in the public trust. That's what we use in the SGC for disseminating our compounds. Um, you sign a little click MTA that says this reagent is given to you in um, as a public trust, use it um, for research, for the greater good of the research community uh, and to understand science and medicine. And, um, you know, uh, so I think you could, um, it, it, the more people think in that way, and just as, as you said, Megan, you need some large scale um, uh, first players in that area who are gonna um, start to make it the norm and then it, then it will become the norm. So maybe the more we can do to support each other in those um, getting those uh, concepts off the ground, the better. And 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 maybe this is um, something that's probably relevant to to lots of the groups of target twenty thirty five. You know, just the availability or access to the knockout lines as they become available right like they're they're useful biologically but they're they're critical <laughs> uh and and a real slow step for for the for antibody validation characterization whatever you want to call it um 
it would be it would, I think we could learn a lot from looking at what all, all the other groups are doing as well and how they're how they're doing it and and, and sort of figuring out better ways to work together because um I mean I know the, I know the work that Icarus is doing and, and how they've been fortunate to get fortunate to get cell lines in many cases for some of the most important targets that they've been working on <clears throat> but you know you don't want to be limited in your characterization to only looking at targets for which there's an existing knockout or right so maybe there's a organizational um, uh, to do item yeah. <laughs> within target 35 2035 to um, that's that's a key component it sounds yeah. like yeah, same for same for validating um, chemical tools, right? You know, if you put a compound in towards your target that's not there, and you, you see a phenotype, then <laughs> something's wrong. Absolutely. Yeah. We are right on time. I think um, it'd, be, it'd be great to continue the discussion, but I, I want to be sort of cognizant of everybody's time. So maybe this is a good place to end, and and hopefully we can figure out a way to continue this discussion sort of offline in the future. Um, but thanks to everyone for, for showing up and, and participating and thanks to our, our speakers um, for, you know, showing us what's possible, <laughs> I think, uh, and where, where we could go with, with, with sort of antibody tools in the next couple of years. And I, I think it's actually super exciting and, and um, hopefully. I agree. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for presenting. And um, I think the future is bright. <laughs> it will get brighter. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you.